University of California at Irvine, and I was the founding director for the Center for Virus Research, also at the University of California, Irvine. Virolution is a process of evolution that's mediated by the addition of virus information to the host. Uh, historically, when such a process has been seen and it's abundant in all domains of life, that has been thought of as uh, sort of an unimportant event unrelated to, to uh, the adaptation and survival of the host. But viruses have a lot of selection because there exists this enormous virus sphere that wasn't appreciated historically, and certainly not during the genesis of uh, sort of the modern synthesis of uh, Darwinian thinking. Uh, we now know that viruses are the most abundant entities on the planet. This is true in most habitats evaluated by metagenomics so far. Viruses are also abundant uh, in all genomes of all orders of life, and they are typically the most dynamic component of that genome. Virolution is the process that encompasses the virosphere and its consequence to the genomes of the host and the relationship of an organism to its environment. There are many different kinds of viruses. Uh, in the oceans, uh, the type of virus that prevails are these double-stranded uh, DNA viruses that are packaged in these capsids, these icosahedral shapes. They typically have tails, and the uh, abundance of the viruses infect uh, prokaryotes, they infect bacteria, archaea. Uh, there are a lot of other types of viruses, and they're generally domain-specific. Plants, higher plants, for example, have lots of RNA viruses. Um, humans have an array of their own peculiar viruses. But the genomes of eukaryotes uh, have lots of endogenous retroviruses, which uh, typically makes one of the most plastic components of eukaryotic genomes. We cannot help but worry about the association of viruses with disease. This is why we are compelled to study them. We need to protect ourselves against the action of viruses. And they are, they are substantial. Um, you know, in history, viral diseases have accounted for many millions of human deaths. So we are compelled to pay attention to virus disease. But as a consequence of such a focus on the disease character of them, we have ignored this whole other biology that they have and that is their ability to stably persist in a host and as a consequence change the host relationship with virus, the same virus or other virus. And since the world is a virus sphere, this has a big consequence for the ability of a particular lineage uh, to do well. It's a common belief that uh, particularly among Sort of traditional thinkers of evolutionary biology, that viral genes are stolen from the host. This is a very prevalent view. And we can actually find examples where this happens, but it is uh, not the common relationship. If you, for example, go into the ocean and you analyze the composition of the viral, these DNA phage that we were talking about, the great bulk of that information does not derive from the host. And we have seen some of the very giant viruses that had over a thousand genes. Very little of that information can be derived from the host. Much of it seems to be virus specific. So metagenomics informs us uh, that the bulk of viral genes have no host counterparts, yet the, um, the view persists that, that if viruses have genes, they pick them off from the host. And I think we just need to, to change that view. The definition of life in the context of virus uh, actually becomes quite fuzzy when you consider that some viruses have uh, more complicated uh, gene coding capacity than some cells. So when a big complicated virus infects a cell, it really takes over the genetic program completely of that cell and expresses a whole set of other genes. That cell is not necessarily dead, sometimes they persist. Uh, so 
that state of a virus colonized host is a state that would be equivalent to life for a virus. When it assembles into a structure, is packaged and exported, it resembles an inert chemical. So what confuses people is that viruses are both chemical and living in nature, depending on the situation. Now most people feel that viruses um, depend on a host uh, for replication and or maintenance, that they are genetic parasites of the host. And therefore, uh, before you had cells, you could not have a virus. Um, we're now starting to realize, experimentally even, that any time you put together a replicator system, a system of uh, replicating molecules uh, that's able to propagate itself, that it becomes susceptible almost immediately to the action of viruses. Indeed, many have felt that this parasitic tendency poses a big problem for the origin of uh, replicators and the origins of cells. But my assessment is very different, is that in order to emerge a complicated uh, system of replication, you actually needed viruses uh, at the very start, because viruses are basically parasitic versions of self, uh, and you need to generate a diverse set of replicators that are self-interacting in order to create uh, a more complex capacity. So in the context of, uh, say, RNA snapback replicators, stem lip replicators, you would need to create versions of diversity in order to act in a com combinatorial, cooperative fashion and then generate uh, the capacity for replication. In other words, this virus lifestyle, this virus concept would be essential even for the very origin of complex replicators to, to initiate. So from that argument, I would say there is no stage in the evolution of life in which the viral life cycle wasn't important and necessary uh, for the system to generate the complexity that it will need. The idea that viruses were uh, involved or necessary for the origin of life is, is very counterintuitive because one has to sort of step back and examine this from a more general definition of a virus as a genetic parasite of the host system. Um, but the problem comes up is that the host system needs parasitic replicators in order to generate complementation and diversity. Uh, and this, uh, this seems to be a, a logical conundrum. How can you parasitize a system uh, which hasn't come into existence yet? In a sense. So if you examine you know, the simplest of replicators from a parasitic perspective, uh, a, sim a simple RNA stem loop, for example, which is thought to be the ancestor uh, to the RNA world uh, and to living systems as we know it. Then when that replicator, if it was able to be copied by some process, even a chemical process, uh, in order for this uh, concept to get going and to apply to the origin of life, it needs to promote the generation of variation of self. In other words, it needs to, it needs to generate diversity. Uh, and this is not error, The diversity is essential for allowing replicators to interact with other replicators in complex ways. And this generates a sufficient self-identity so that the system is actually capable of functioning cooperatively. Once it attains this level of uh, sort of diverse self versions uh, and can start generating cooperatively, it starts being capable of generating more complex function, such as a ribozyme. A ribozyme is uh, basically an RNA molecule that has a set of stem loop structures that fold in very complex ways and together the folded structure allows the ribosome to attain catalytic activity such as ligase, endonuclease, or replication of the RNA. So in order to get to the point where an RNA is capable of, of more independently replicating an RNA, it needs to go through this cooperative process uh, where you have variations of cell sort of uh, working together uh, to, to create a more complex ability. Experimentally, we are now starting to see evidence in which uh, various labs 
evaluated the capacity of RNA replicators to copy self, and we're seeing the emergence of complexity and the emergence of networks and the emergence of interaction very early on in, in these uh, events. So the implication of all this is that you need to generate diversity and you need interaction uh, that resembles a virus-host interaction uh, in order to get the system going. So by that line of reasoning, uh, this virus concept was essential for the origin of life. The idea that viruses uh, might participate in some kind of cooperative state uh, will seem strange to most people. Uh, viruses, after all, are the ultimate genetic parasite, selfish, uh, and they seem completely capable of operating as individuals. Why would we think that uh, they promote cooperative uh, interactions? Indeed, there is a uh, major theory of, uh, for the understanding of virus evolution that was initially developed by Manfred Eigen in the 70s, in which it was assumed that um, there existed a version of the genome of the virus, we call it the master fittest type, and that viruses uh, would copy themselves with high error rates and generate diversity, uh, and this diversity could behave uh, as a population according to uh, the principles that were developed in the theory called quasi-species. So the original version of quasi-species was based on an individual type molecule generating diversity or errors really, but from that errors uh, choosing uh, versions or variants of itself uh, that were able to function in the habitat, basically natural selection. Uh, this led to decades of experimental study um, which observed many things including uh, frequently uh, social aspects of the behavior of the virus population. And it was observed experimentally that viruses frequently showed uh, internal interactions in their populations that were not expected in quasi species theory. This included things like complementation, interference, lethal defection, uh, trans complementation, an, ar an array of features which seem to be cooperative and interactive. And indeed, in the following years, a series of experimental results showed that for viruses to really truly be fit, they, uh, they need to generate diversity, and they apparently uh, need to function cooperatively. The thought experiment is the following. If you consider the problem of HIV, uh, human immunodeficiency virus type 1, we know that it, it uh, replicates as a quasi-species in infected human patients, and that this is a very dynamic thing. Uh, and this dynamic character is why our immune system can't deal with it. It stays ahead of the immune system. And this dynamic character is also why we have such difficulty uh, generating vaccines against it. So this virus can defeat uh, the entire complexity of our immune system as well as our combined world technology because of its capacity to generate diversity. Historically, this has been thought of as error. But if we were to make the master fittest type version of HIV as a, say, DNA clone, and if we could prevent it from generating diversity by, say, we had a high fidelity replicase instead of the usual reverse transcriptase, the outcome would be pretty predictable. This virus would not pose the difficulty it poses if it is not able to diversify. As long as we think of that as error, I think we think of it as the wrong way, which was the uh, characterization in the original Manfred Eigen paper. But if we think of it as the capacity to cooperate, interact, and diversify, that the diversity is essential uh, for the fitness of the system, then we end up with a very different view of uh, viral replicators as being fundamentally cooperative. And I think it's that view that, that we can uh, use to, say, reevaluate virus host relationships. You know, the, the prevailing view is genes and open reading frames, proteins, uh, are the main determinant of the complexity of an organism. These days, it's become apparent that uh, eukaryotes really are complex because of how they regulate their genes. 
they don't have that many more genes in them like a worm. Um, but the regulatory complexity uh, is poorly understood. It's coming from, from RNA molecules. Um, and most of these RNA molecules are derived from uh, what we consider parasitic sequences of retroviruses and retrotransposons. So there's becoming a paradigm shift in understanding how complexity works. And it does stem from these, uh, from these uh, parasitic sequences in ways we are just now starting to understand. The usual view is that when you see a viral gene uh, being used by a host, for example, a bi uh, the glycoprotein of a retrovirus being essential for the function of the human placenta, which we know is the case. And most uh, people who work in the study of that field would say, well, this is an example of some convenient viral gene being taken up and used by the host for a particular purpose. The problem with that idea is that, well, it's not just one, it's a whole set of viral genes that got used for that purpose. And the whole set is distinct in different lineages, like the viruses we use as primates, as humans, is quite distinct from the ones that rodents use. These are different lineages of virus. On top of that, the regulation of these genes is also being accomplished by a very complicated mixture of other retroviruses. So all told, to express one, what we would call, exapted viral gene, like secession, uh, we had to have maybe six retroviruses that cooperated to create the regulatory regions that expresses that one retrovirus-derived gene. So these issues are not generally confronted with this line of thinking. But if we look at it from the perspective that viruses are originating these networks and creating these complicated solutions, like the one needed to invent a placenta, then that gives us a very different perspective. So viruses were clearly uh, involved in the origin of the placenta, in the origin of the placental network, but they were involved in very complicated ways that we're still struggling to understand. Viruses always uh, colonize their host and change the identity of their host in relationship to other viruses. This we know is a, is a well, sort of characterized phenomenon. This has consequence to groups. A uh, population that's colonized by a particular virus will now have a different relationship, not only with that viruses, but a bunch of related viruses, and what transmits to them and what causes disease in them and what they can transmit and diseases that can cause in other species has been changed by that event. This really changes the group dynamic of the population. So viruses are sort of an endless source of layers of complexity and identity that colonize the host. This is why the genome of a eukaryote is just this long history of a series of colonizations by retroviruses and other retrotransposons in a very dynamic, sort of unending way. And humans have undergone a recent and rather dramatic change along these lines they required some new retroviruses and they really expanded their retroposons like line elements uh, in a very large degree and these are the elements uh, that are really controlling brain development and higher cognition in humans so viruses were really involved in that in ways that we're just starting to explore uh, they have affected the identity of all their host uh, in complex ways that affect group behaviors group survival. We can look at uh, the most recent events in human evolution from a virus perspective to see if there is evidence that viruses were involved in recent human evolution. And the best evidence for this is uh, comparing anatomically modern human DNA to those of the um, sort of recently extinct uh, relatives such as the Neanderthals whose genome was sequenced uh, earlier this year in, in, in a high quality film. Um, and there we can see clear evidence that there is a virus difference between anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals in the case that there are, for example, endogenous retroviruses that you can find in the Neanderthal genome that you don't find so much in the human genome. And the converse is also true, there are endogenous retroviruses, even more numerous, if anything, that you find in the human genome uh, that you don't find in the Neanderthal 
Now there's other evidence to suggest that when humans and Neanderthals came together, there was some type of virus exchange. And the evidence for this is found in the genes that are central to the control of the antiviral immune response. There's a couple of them associated with the detection and the initiation of the interferon response. One of them is called STAT2, but there are others as well. Um, and what has been determined recently as a consequence of sequencing is that there appears to have been some uh, inbreeding between Neanderthals and humans. And the way we can tell this is because the Neanderthal version of STAT2 and some of these other genes is now found in anatomically modern humans in Europe and East Asia. So for whatever reason, the core antiviral gene of Neanderthals has ended up in some of the human descendants that uh, bred with the Neanderthal population. This also suggests some great exchange of viruses, but not in ways we can really understand because it's not obvious that this corresponds to a plague sweep uh, with respect to one or the other population. So it's, it's hard to know what it's telling us, but it does tell us that there's a big virus footprint in the difference between Neanderthals and anatomic and modern humans. The capacity of a virus to become part of a host, this is historically well known based on the sequencing of host genomes. But there is a, a real-time ongoing event that's happening right now in Australia with the koala bears. They have apparently been exposed to what was probably once an endogenous retrovirus from a rodent, uh, most likely from southern India, which managed to uh, infect koalas in Australia. Um, and the initial result was the, uh, the promotion of leukemia by koalas and the transmission of this leukemia to other koalas. And in the last several decades, this has occurred in uh, sort of recent history. Uh, the virus has penetrated virtually all the populations on the mainland of uh, koalas, and those animals that's, that uh, die from leukemia are undergoing uh, endogenization. The virus is becoming part of their DNA. What we're ending up with is a, a population of koalas that now has a new sort of genetic composition that was brought to it by the virus, and it's a complicated composition. It's not just one gene, it's a, it's a whole family of uh, genetic pieces that have become part of the DNA. But this new koala, this new viral koala, is different from the historic one. The historic one still exists on islands off of Australia, and it's virus-free. It's pretty clear what would happen if we bring these two populations together one with the virus uh, would be capable of, of transmitting that virus to the one without the virus, and that would cause a selective sweep of the population without the virus. So this is the basic uh, phenomenon that must have occurred in the evolution of the higher organisms. The fact that virus is the most selfish of all entities have led us experimentally, to conclude that they are fundamentally cooperative and consortial is a sort of the greatest irony, because this is leading to understanding a different process when viral information rains down on a chromosome and disturbs the, um, the other parasitic agents, such as the lines, alums, and retroposons. It seems like a societal response that is fundamentally cooperative when a viral network rains down on a genome and creates a new network for the control of the placenta in order for it to provide the coherent elements of regulation that distribute into the 1,500 genes that created the placenta is inherently a cooperative and coherent process. This is not error-based uh, selection and individual fittest type selection. It, it is a different thing. It's a process that predates the synthesis and still exists. Uh, it's, it seems to be the process needed for the origin of life, and it seems to be the process that still rains down in the DNA. So DNA, is, in this context, looks like a habitat, a habitat for these cooperating species of RNA uh, parasites, in a sense. <laughs>
parasites that bring coherence, novelty, uh, and uh, more complexity to the host. 